No News Prospect family, welcome to RTB 2021 for October 3rd, 2021. Hope you're having a great day today, and I hope you have a wonderful Lord's Day, a great time of worship today with uh, with family of God and with uh, your family as well. So our text for today, we have 1 Kings chapter 6, important text in 1 Kings as we move uh, to see Solomon building the temple. Uh, then we have, uh, which will dominate the next few chapters, by the way, in, in 1 Kings, a uh, very significant event in the history of Israel. Then we have Ephesians 3, Ezekiel 36, and then finally we have Psalm 86. So let me start with, um, let me start over here with Ephesians uh, chapter 3. So in Ephesians 3, we have uh, Paul doing a couple of things here. He's um, telling something about his own ministry, which he deems to be um, uh, stewardship of God's grace, uh, which was given to me for you. And he's speaking here specifically of the Gentile uh, believers and how he had been given this ministry to proclaim the, quote, mystery of Christ uh, to the Gentiles, that they are now fellow heirs and members of the body of Christ, fellow partakers of the promise of Jesus, verse 6. It's a beautiful picture of what we now have as, as Gentile believers being brought into uh, this wonderful uh, covenant, new covenant with God that uh, we'll talk about here in just a minute in Ezekiel uh, 36. Uh, so Paul talks about all these, all this, this, uh, this ministry that has been given to him. He tells them not to lose heart at the tribulations that he's experiencing on, on their behalf because of this ministry that's been given to him um, to preach the unfathomable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. That's a a recollection back to chapter two, verse seven here, uh, where it talks about the riches of the of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus that we receive because of but God, right? Uh, so, and then finally, in in the last part of this chapter, Paul continues to talk about, or actually continues a prayer that he began all the way back in chapter one. Uh, he's praying that. Um, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That's recalling language from chapter one as well. You probably recognize that, uh, that to be strengthened with the power, with power through his spirit and the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you're being rooted and grounded in love or to be uh, able to comprehend with all the saints with the breadth and depth and length and height uh, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses uh, knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. What a beautiful prayer that is of what Paul is praying that will happen to uh, these this church in Ephesus, a prayer that we can pray uh, as well on behalf of the, the folks who God has put in our family um, here at New Prospect, uh, that we may be filled up with the fullness of God, that we may uh, know the love of Christ, that we may be grounded and rooted uh, in um, in love, and that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints. This is a corporate prayer, prayer isn't it? What is the breadth and length and height and depth of, of, of understanding of this gospel of Jesus Christ, this mystery that Paul is proclaiming? And then finally, he ends with a benediction now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, uh, and he closes with an amen. That's a really very clear sign that Paul is moving to a different section in this letter, and he will do so in chapter four. The practical applications of all his theology that he's expounded on in chapters one through three. All right, we'll move on to uh, Psalm. We'll go to Psalm 86. Psalm 86 is a um, prayer of supplication and trust. It's a prayer of David, um, and it is one that is probably could uh, characterize as an individual lament as well. Uh, it's asking God to in, once again intervene. What struck me about this, though, as I read through it, is how many times he addresses God in the second person. This is a very personal prayer uh, on the part of the psalmist, and he is um, and he uses very personal language, even the, even what we would call anthropomorphic language of God. Incline your ear and answer me, O Lord. Um, and he addresses God as you over and over again. I actually went through and underlined all the different yous or yours in here. It's, oh, you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Verse two, be gracious to me, O Lord, and for to you I cry out all day long. Make glad the, the soul of your servant, 
for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and are ready to forgive, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can go, you can do that through the rest of this psalm. It's a it's a wonderful pattern, and it's a wonderful picture of of the relationship that we too have through Christ uh, with our heavenly Father that we can address Him uh, in such personal and intimate ways. Uh, beautiful psalm here in Psalm eighty six, a psalm of trust in in Him. First King 6, as I mentioned, this is a passage that starts to describe the building of the temple, uh, and it describes the first 10 verses here describe the, uh, the construction of the outside, the exterior, describing the exterior of this, this temple structure, um, and then the uh, starting about verse 14, uh, he describes the interior of the temple. And obviously, we could spend a lot of time talking about the, the structure, and there's significance to that. Uh, the, just the, the order and care that goes into the sacred space. Remember that the temple was a, um, I mean, there's so much significant about the temple, but primarily, this is the dwelling place of God, right? This is God dwelling among his people. This is God's place of his rule, where he would literally place his name, Um this would, of course, be the, uh, the source of the, the Jewish hope as well, that God was now dwelling with his covenant people. So again, back to that storyline, if at any point in time Israel was going to do what they were supposed to do, it's now. Uh, but of course they don't. Um, and uh, problems start with, with the king himself. And there's a hint at that here, even in this text. Look at verse 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this house which you're building, if you will walk by my statutes and if you will execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments and walk in them, this is a reference back to Deuteronomy 17, by the way, and also to 2 Samuel 7. Uh, then I will carry out my word with you that I spoke to David, your father, and I will dwell among the sons of Israel, will not forsake my people Israel. Now, of course, eventually in the exile, what happens? Well, the temple is destroyed, and, and the people of Israel seem forsaken, and so they are thinking, I think at the time, they're just concentrating on that verse 13, uh, that God will always dwell among us. His temple will always be here. Uh, God will always be among his people, and, and he will not forsake us, but there's a key qualification to that, isn't there, for those Jewish people? Uh, and that is concerning this house which you are building, if you will walk, if you will execute, if you will keep, if you will, uh, uh, again, walk in them, then I will carry out my word. And the, the kings in the line of David didn't, starting with Solomon. Um, so we'll comment more about the, the significance of the temple in future days, but, um, but here we have, uh, I think, a kind of a um, again, the, the writer is writing from the perspective of the exile. And so it's kind of a, a scary um, prediction of what else would happen of the downfall of Israel caused by the kings. But Ezekiel 36 gives us a picture of God's restoration of Israel. Now, we mentioned this uh, yesterday that, that you had this prophecy against Mount Seir. Um, Say year in the Hebrew. It's, I think it's how you pronounce it in the Hebrew. Um, with, uh, of course, representative Edom against Israel during the exile, cheering them on, uh, cheering on the the Babylonians on as they as they destroyed Jerusalem. Um, they were cursed. Uh, and this is a prophecy, though, that speaks of the blessing of the mountains of Israel and the restoration of them. And it's interesting that. As you read through that and the, the prophecies of judgment in chapter 35, it says, then they will know that I'm the Lord, then I will know that I'm the Lord three times over, uh, as we've seen throughout. But when God causes his people to be restored, when he multiplies man and beast and they're fruitful and, and multiplying, verse 11, uh, this is speaking of covenantal blessing as they are restored and the blessing of the covenant is being restored, meaning that the covenant itself has been restored with Israel. You know what? Then they will know that I am the Lord. So both his judgment and his restoration have as their larger purpose of letting everybody know who Jesus, who, who God is, 
uh, then they will know that he is the Lord. Skipping down to verse 22, we have a significant passage of restoration. Why is God, God going to restore Israel? Well, it's not for their sake, verse 22 states, but for his holy name's sake. This is something we uh, discussed, I think, all the way back in the book of Numbers in chapter 20. Remember in Numbers chapter 20 that Moses, uh, that's when he struck the rock and rebelled against the Lord. Uh, well, what, what, what happened after that? Well, uh, God said that I was, that I, that he was going to, um, to prohibit Moses from entering into the promised land. Uh, and it's because that Moses did not uphold his name as holy. God acts when his name is not upheld as holy, God acts to do so himself. And this is what he's doing. He is acting uh, to, in his judgment against Israel, uh, to uphold his holy name, but also in the restoration of Israel. Uh, he is going to uphold his holy name in that way as well. Um, and so what will God do when he takes them and brings them back from the nations um, and, and uh, proves himself as holy in their sight? What will he do? Well, he will, in verse 26, give them a new heart and a new spirit. Um, I preached on this text. If you remember back when I was looking at the metaphors of salvation, I talked about the new heart that God gives us. Uh, and a beautiful picture of the, the nature and the, the radical nature of, of salvation. Uh, and God will put his spirit within you and cause you to walk in his statutes so that you be careful, observe his ordinances. It's because they did not walk in his statutes, that they didn't keep God's covenant, that they went into exile. But in this new covenant, he's going to give them the ability to be in right covenant relationship, not based on their own uh, righteousness, but based on, of course, uh, we know the righteousness of Christ. Um, and then the nations who see it, verse 26, will know that it is the Lord who has done it, and they will know who he is when they see uh, God's ultimate restoration of his people. It's a beautiful text. I love Ezekiel 36, and it's, it's prophecy of the restoration of God's people that we get to participate in because, as uh, Paul says, this mystery of Christ has been extended to even us as Gentiles, to be brought in to the people of God. Great text for today on this day, October 3rd, 2021. Hope you have a great rest of the day.